Today we have quite a wild looking integral. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of x minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed all times the natural logarithm of x. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting structure and it just screams apply Feynman's technique. So that's exactly what we're going to do. First, we define the integral function i of some parameter alpha, and we'll define it as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed all times log x dx. And the reason for this is if we differentiate partially with respect to alpha, the x to the alpha term, we get x to the alpha times log x. So the log x terms would cancel out quite nicely. And the target integral i is actually the integral function evaluated at alpha equal to 1. So yeah, it seemed like a good plan. So we'll differentiate with respect to the alpha parameter. And on switching up the integration and differentiation operators, we now have the integral from 0 to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of x to the alpha minus 1 divided by all of this stuff, and we can factorize the polynomial in the denominator as 1 plus x times 1 plus x squared times log x integration with respect to x. Now because we're differentiating partially with respect to alpha, the only function we're concerned with for that purpose is x to the alpha minus 1, where everything else is just going to be held as a constant. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by 1 plus x times 1 plus x squared times log x, and the derivative of x to the alpha minus 1 with respect to alpha is x to the alpha times log x. So we see some nice cancellation happening here, and we see that the derivative of i with respect to alpha looks a lot more friendly in comparison to the target integral. So we have x to the alpha upstairs, and we have 1 plus x times 1 plus x squared downstairs. And what we could use here is a partial fraction decomposition. So let me write this as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha times, let me see what would work here. We have 1 plus x down here, and 1 plus x squared down here. So to get rid of the x squared terms, a 1 minus x term would work quite well here because 1 plus x times 1 minus x would be 1 minus x squared. And I just need a 1 here with a plus sign in between. Yeah, that seems good to go. But wait, wait, wait. We'll need a factor of 1 half to balance things out because this way we'd get 2 in the numerator. Okay, everything's all good now. So we have 1 half times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha divided by 1 plus x dx plus the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha divided by 1 plus x squared dx minus the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha plus 1 divided by 1 plus x squared dx. Now for the last two integrals here, I'm going to apply transformation letting x squared equal t. This implies that x equals t to the 1 half, and this further implies that dx equals 1 half times t to the negative 1 half dt. So my two integrals now turn into 1 half, the integral from 0 to infinity, of t to the alpha by 2 times t to the negative 1 half divided by 1 plus t dt minus 1 half again times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the alpha plus 1 by 2 times t to the negative 1 half divided by 1 plus t. Okay, cool. So that means I have the derivative of i with respect to alpha equal to 1 half times the integral from 0 to infinity. Wait, let me just expand this by multiplying out the 1 half. So I have 1 half the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha divided by 1 plus x dx, and plus 1 quarter now, the integral from 0 to infinity. And because t and x are just dummy variables, I can rename all the t's back to x. And I have x to the alpha minus 1 by 2 divided by 1 plus x dx minus a quarter of the integral from 0 to infinity and here I would have x to the alpha by 2 divided by 1 plus x dx. 
Now to invoke what's probably my favorite trick. It's the reflection formula for the gamma function. The integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus x dx is the integral form for Euler's wonderful reflection formula. So this means it's equal to gamma s times gamma 1 minus s, and this of course gives us pi times the cosecant of pi times s. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to alpha is pi by 2 times the cosecant of what exactly? Here s minus 1 equals alpha, so that means s equals alpha plus 1, so we have pi alpha plus pi, then we have pi by 4 4 times what exactly? The cosecant of the value of s minus 1 here is alpha by 2 minus 1 by 2, meaning that s should be alpha by 2 plus 1 by 2. We have pi alpha by 2 plus pi by 2 then. And finally, we have negative pi by 4 times the cosecant of pi alpha by 2 plus pi. Okay, now to deal with all these phase shifts, we have pi by 2 times a cosecant being phase shifted by pi means I would have the negative of the cosecant. Okay, cool. So I have negative cosecant pi alpha plus pi by 4 times now the secant, and that's going to be, yeah, a plus sign, secant of pi alpha by 2 minus pi by 4 times, yeah, again, a plus sign here. And wait, did I get this right? Yeah, it's all right. And plus sign now, pi times cosecant of pi alpha by 2. So finally, we have the derivative of i with respect to alpha completely in terms of the alpha parameter. And now we need to recover the integral function by integrating with respect to alpha. So on the left hand side I have i of alpha and on the right first up I have this antiderivative sorts out to one half times the logarithm of cosecant pi alpha minus cotangent pi alpha plus pi by two. Yeah, no wait. The factor of pi is needed for the antiderivative. We still have 1 by 2 times log secant pi alpha by 2 plus tangent pi alpha by 2. Then we have plus 1 half again. Natural log cosecant pi alpha by 2 minus cotangent pi alpha by 2. Okay, so we have quite a few logarithms that we can now combine. We factor out one half, combine the logs, and that means we have in the numerator the secant of pi alpha by 2 plus the tangent of pi alpha by 2. And this is going to be multiplied by the cosecant of pi alpha by 2. You know what, get rid of the parentheses here. They just make everything look a lot more clunky than necessary. So I have secant pi alpha by 2 plus tangent pi alpha by 2 times cosecant pi alpha by 2 minus cotangent pi alpha by 2. And all of this, all of this is going to be divided by the cosecant of pi alpha minus the cotangent of pi alpha. And don't forget the constant of integration that we now have to determine. And for that, we're going to have to recall what exactly the integral function was. Okay, so this is how the integral function was defined. And a useful case here looks like alpha being equal to zero. But looking at the equation in white tells us that directly plugging in alpha equal to zero is not a good idea. But we could work with a limit. So we'll use the limit of i of alpha as alpha tends to zero. That gives me the integral from zero to infinity, or you know what, just visualize it up here. This thing, as alpha approaches zero, approaches one, which means in the numerator, I'm going to have one minus one, and the whole thing is going to crash down to zero. 
So the limit of i of alpha as alpha tends to zero is zero, and I want to apply the limit to the equation in white. But I should probably simplify the trigonometric mess in the natural logarithm first. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Let me just zoom out a bit here. Yeah, just decrease the size. And there we go. So I have i of alpha being equal to one half the logarithm of a lot of stuff. I have the secant plus the tangent. So expanding the secant and the tangent gives me one plus sine of pi alpha by two divided by the cosine of pi alpha by two. And I have the cosecant minus the cotangent, so that would be one minus the cosine of pi alpha by two divided by the sine of pi alpha by two. And the sine times the cosine thing looks promising. Why am I saying that? Well, in the denominator, I have again cosecant minus cotangent. So that is one minus the cosine of pi alpha divided by the sine of pi alpha. And the sine of pi alpha can be expanded as twice the sine of pi alpha by two times the cosine of pi alpha by two. Okay, that is pretty good because the sine terms cancel out and so do the cosines, meaning that I'm left with one half the logarithm of two times one plus sine of pi by, again, terribly sorry about that, sine of pi alpha by two times one minus the cosine of pi alpha by two. And all of this is being divided by one minus the cosine of pi alpha. Now for the limiting case, in the limit as alpha tends to zero, the limit of this thing here, the one plus sine of pi alpha by two is defined. The limit is one. It's this limit, uh, that is the limit of one minus cosine pi alpha by two divided by one minus cosine pi alpha. That's a cause of concern. So let me evaluate that limit separately. So we have the limit as alpha tends to zero of one minus cosine pi alpha by two divided by one minus the cosine of pi alpha. This is a zero by zero case, so we need L'Hopital's rule. I'm left with the limit as alpha tends to zero and on differentiating the numerator and denominator, I have pi by two times the sine of pi alpha by two divided by pi times the sine of pi alpha. Okay, this is still a zero by zero form. So again, one more application of L'Hopital's rule. Let me just take out the factor of one half. So I have one half the limit as alpha tends to zero. Again, on differentiation, I have cosine pi alpha by two times pi by two divided by pi times cosine pi alpha. So now, as alpha tends to zero, I have one by one times one half. So this all sorts out to a quarter. Okay, great. So now I can apply the limit as alpha tends to zero to the equation for i of alpha, and that would give me on the left-hand side a big fat zero, and on the right I have one half times the logarithm of two times this thing approaches one as alpha approaches zero, and the limit of all of this stuff is a quarter. So we have two times a quarter plus the constant of integration c. So that means we have zero equal to one half times log one half plus c, which implies that c equals negative one half log one half, or we can say that c equals one half of log two. Okay, great. And now, we're interested in the case of alpha being equal to one. So i of one is the target integral i, and plugging in alpha equal to one, we have one half the logarithm of two times sine of pi by two is one, so we have two here, and sine uh, the cosine of pi by two is a zero, so we have a zero there, divide that by 
1 minus the cosine of pi would be 1 minus negative 1. So that's a 2 over there as well. Some cancellation plus the constant of integration we just found out to be 1 half of log 2. And all of this implies that the target in integral i equals 1 half log 2 plus 1 half log 2. In other words, we have i equal to log 2, which is actually a pretty cute result for such a monstrous looking integral. And if you plug in alpha equal to 1 half, then you actually get the logarithm of square root 2, which is pretty interesting as well. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.